Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Julia Aisha. I embraced Islam 11 years ago in Masjid al Aqsa, Palestine, having thought about it for about a decade previously. I'm a classically trained musician, and so the way I unite those two worlds uh, is through my social enterprise, Unity Music, Musika Tawheed in Arabic. On the premise that Allah Wahad and therefore all of his creation is unified in him. All races, religions and cultures. And so I work with diaspora communities in Europe and the Middle East mainly. I've worked with Mahmoud Sabri for half a decade, who is currently in Karachi and sends his salams and he taught me many beautiful qawali three of which i will sing for you today so i will sing two pieces in arabic and two pieces in urdu and we have toured uh, refugee camps in the dodecanese islands of greece in 2016 um, as well as playing in the pakistani embassy in berlin and many other settings including with you uh, many of you will have heard him and even us together. And so I will start with Ya Habib, which is in classical Arabic, a kawali about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his beauty being compared to the moon. And it even says that out of the light of his face was created the moon. And inshallah, we will be performing in Medina and Munawara in Mecca when it becomes possible. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya Habib, Ya Habib, Ya Habib, Ya Habib. I will now move to a different instrument, the cello. Um, 
I think actually uh, it's unusual to hear Tavani on the, the oud and the cello, so I hope you enjoy it. I will start with a halaj setting in classical Arabic by Lebanese composer, singer and, and oud player, Marcel Khalifa. And then I will sing you Amjad Sabri's Last Naat, a subsequent Bartvali. Uh, which he sang less than 24 hours before he was assassinated, Allah Yirham. And finally, Taji Dari Haram, which is the, for me the most beautiful Kavali and was made famous by the Sabri brothers and, and by Amjad, Allah Yirham, Rahmatullah Alaykum. And I hope you enjoy it. Assalamu Alaikum, Rahmatullahi, wa Barakatuh. Kismet Mary, 
Sanctuary. So how has it come to pass that with all our gifts, all God's blessings, all our strengths and powers, all our inventiveness, all our creativity, we seem bent on self-destruction? We seem to be riding this juggernaut of death and despair, riding this tidal wave of hubris and arrogance, sinking into this mire of ignorance, refusing to be grounded, refusing to grow roots. We are pushing our mother, this precious sphere of earth and clouds and water and greenness, beyond her limits, beyond endurance. We are literally testing her to destruction, to the point at which she can no longer sustain us, to the point at which she can no longer nurture and feed us to the point at which the elaborate and marvellous intricacies of creation will be broken down, blown apart, slaughtered, scattered, destroyed, to the point at which she will know that we no longer love her, to the point at which she will know that we have abused her, used her, 
used her all up. At which point the web of life will collapse into despair and we, we humans entrusted as carers and protectors of the earth will have failed and our punishment will be our banishment. The planet will still revolve lovely and lonely and uncared for by those who should have been its proudest custodians. But why? Why will it have come to this? Simply because we have for too long refused to go within. We became too busy. Busy out there doing this, doing that, inventing this, inventing that, playing with the toys which nature gave us. We became too good at pushing the boundaries, testing this, testing that, seeing what would happen if we pushed that button, pulled that lever. We became obsessed and entranced with our own powers and forgot to be grateful, grateful for the miraculous and inexplicable gift of our own existence. We had forgotten the joys of quietness, of retreat, of contemplation, of celebration of the extraordinary now. In a word, we became driven, driven and powered by our own insatiable desire to become masters and mistresses of the universe. But at this moment, at this precise instant of time, we are humbled, humbled by a microscopic speck at the edge of life, a tiny, tiny virus, which has stopped us in our tracks and reminded us once more of the need to go within. So we retreat to a place of safety, to the place of sanctuary. Sanctuary is the calm after the storm. It is the fortress which the hurricane cannot shake. It is the gentle embrace of steadfast friendship. It is the friend on whose door you knock at 4 a.m., scared, bedraggled, cold, broken. And he looks at you and says, come in, sit down, I'll make a cup of tea. Sanctuary is the space you're given when someone, recognising the hurt or the pain or the anguish or the excitement and trepidation in you, just listens. Sanctuary is the time you're given when someone, seeing you just as you are, just lets you be. No advice, no exhortation, no admonishment, just the peace. The peace which passeth all understanding, which comes from being heard and accepted and welcomed. We all need that place of safety. Sanctuary is literally a sacred space. But since scared and sacred are nothing but the same letters in a different sequence, it means a space in which we are not scared. Without safety, we have not the strength to walk the streets alone. Without safety, we have not the peace to sit in our own homes. Without safety, a little child trembles with fear and an old man shakes with anxiety. And when folk ask me about spirituality, I say the first thing and the last is to feel safe, to feel at home. Safe like you're indoors, sitting by your own fire, in your own chair, with your own blanket. Because then, once you feel at home, then, and only then, will you find the courage to go within. This poem is called The Pain of Separation. It is sort of philosophical and sort of autobiographical. The pain of separation is constant. It is like an inability to breathe. It is the precious moment between birth and death, frozen in time. It is like the moment of the gift of life in time and outside time, containing all hopes and all dreams, abandoned like a supermarket trolley in the canal behind the gasworks. It is a chasm of fire, it is a binding, blinding oath, it is an unutterable prayer, it is the time in the hospital court between defeated vulnerability and insane invincibility, it is the moment on the dance floor when the music stops and it won't start again because you stopped it. It is the unopened door, it is the door 
which will never open. With the rusty, trusty lock, it is the hinges which creak with pain. It is the still, sad voices which remain locked inside. It is the doctor screaming into your ear the moment after you stop breathing. It is the grey dove peeking through the hospital window in the dusty dawn. It is the tequila sunrise. It is both God and the devil crashing down from a twisty, lightning-struck tree in the darkness. It is my footsteps running away from the unknown presence at my side. It is the reassuring hand planted on my shoulder by an unseen friend. It is the knowledge that death is neither an end nor a beginning, but is a portal. It is all the books unwritten down all the blind alleys in the town of deafness. It is the fatally turned corner and the burnt bridges. It is the flames of hell being endlessly doused by the balm of loving kindness. It is blindness. It is the sign language of the loud and the magic potions of the proud. It is the malign whisperers haunting and taunting repeating themselves over and over, saying, it's the drugs, it's the drugs. It is the time spent sitting in the ancient chapel and resting on the prehistoric stone. It is the butterflies teasing the way on the path by the sea. It is the wanderer trying to find me. It is the person who gets lost on purpose. It is the riddler, the fiddler, the singer, the dead bell ringer. It is the finger of fate. It is the symbiosis of love and hate. It is the clear blue light after the fight. It is the ecstasy of delight when the tenderest touch explodes in your whole being and everything is light. It is dappled forest shade in early summer when the birds have gone quiet and the paths slope off mysteriously and you don't know which to choose. It is the rippling brook with the logs as a little bridge. It is the epiphany of blackberry picking when your breath is arrested for a moment as the fruit is plucked and the gift of dark juicy sweetness is tasted. It is the endless pealing of bells as if the lamentations will never stop because there has been too much dying. It is the corpses in the trenches trodden, half buried into the mud. It is flying away like carefree seagulls into the sunset. It is digging and delving and burrowing into the dark night of the soul. It is the stillness which you find there in the depths. It is the many worn steps downward, deep downward, in the ancient church, into the crypt, and then the crypt beneath the crypt. It is the silent, radiant, bejeweled tomb, which you discover in the deep coolness. It is the tiniest of creatures, a minuscule spider or fly entrusting itself to your giant hand and your breath, which desperately tries to blow it away before it is crushed. It is the spider on its own thread, which interposes itself carefully between speaker and listener as if to say, see me, I am a part of this universe just as you are. I am partaking of these blessings, just like you, but you don't know me, and you never will, but I know you. It is the moment in the pub garden when I saw you standing up to get a drink, and I asked the good Lord to protect you, because I knew at that point I no longer could. 
It is the warship full of flesh and blood hit suddenly by a torpedo, an expected, dreaded torpedo, and it's in then those few moments of searing fire and engulfing ocean which casts all these souls into an abyss and through the portal, the threshold between death and life, all of a sudden, just like that. And it is knowing that that could have been predicted, that the warship was designed for that eventuality. It is the moment on the bus in the busy town on that special day when I saw you standing there and knew, and I knew that this was new and would be renewed and would be both known and unknown and would be thrown and grown and flown over and over and would be a covenant. It is the meeting of souls. It is the greeting of old friends who know each other better than they know themselves. It is the clear mirrors of destiny. It is the sweetest sound that drowns all pain. It is the fusion of thought and feeling. It is the mind which tumbles and fumbles, forever reeling, reeling in memories, stealing from the past and never slowing down. Yes, the pain of separation engenders all of this. This is another one which is sort of philosophical and sort of autobiographical, but also one of my poems which, which draws a lot on dreams. So it's provisionally called The Alchemy of Reason. In dreams there is often something lost or something strange, something forgotten, a path I cannot find, a mistake, something missing. Often in these dreams I am a teacher again in a massive, frightening institution, for there is a problem. I cannot find my timetable. The timetable is secret. It is hidden. I do not have a desk. I cannot remember which class I am teaching, or where, or why, or even what subject I am supposed to teach. In these dreams I am hiding, ducking, diving, and the fear is palpable. I am avoiding, avoiding everything, hiding from authority who lurk in corridors and offices, but who at any moment might see me, feeling scared, sick, paranoid, but trying to act normal, hoping that my act will be believed, that there is someone, somewhere, who will see the real me and release me from this twisted maze of uncertainty. Who am I? Where am I? This dream world seems real enough, but I am exposed, uncomfortably exposed, when I want to hide. What am I supposed to be doing? Will I be held to account? What about all those students I should have taught? All those classes where I was missing, knowing, fearing that eventually I will be found out. But in one dream there was a house whose upper floor became a hill and open fields and sky and butterflies and peace and opening into space. There was another where I went into an ordinary looking basement room and suddenly I was on a beach or beside a river or wandering through a busy fishing harbour. Then there are the vehicle dreams, skeleton trains, broken, brown, bicycles, a car with no mirrors, a big black bus with no driver. Dreams are a sort of alchemical experiment where I am the substance being experimented upon, mixing real and unreal, fusing fantasy and reality. So I have known real dodgy vehicles and really terrifying classrooms or sinister spying bosses. There have been real broken down buses and derelict houses, real blind alleys, real fires, real floods real fierce storms. On some quiet, ordinary days I read a book or watch a film and wake the next bright morning thinking, I wonder how so-and-so is getting on. 
before I realised that so-and-so is a character from the book I was reading or from the film I was watching. The person is not real, but they are. They are real to me. They have entered my imagination. They've become part of me. And sometimes the opposite is true. The real seems unreal. So, waking on some bright morning, morning I think, did that really happen? Did I really say that? Did she really do that? In what we call reality, there are layers and layers like a cake, like an onion, like the planet Earth, like your own mind, like your own emotions, like a holy book, like a secret poem. We dig sometimes to uncover the hidden layers or we slice the onion and find no center, nothing but layers. Or we crack the nut to try to find the heart, pierce to the kernel, mash up the seed, and then destroy the possibility of growth. In this balancing act we call life, there are many ways of losing balance. You can analyse too much and too little. Too much dissection and you can never, never, ever put Humpty Dumpty together again. Too little, and all the king's horses and all the king's men ride roughshod through the corn, burning the haystacks and torching the cottages. You can feel too much or too little. Too much and you may drown in fearsome, raging floods of blood-red hot tears. You may be swept away in clear, cold avalanches of frozen, piercing, steely anger. Too little and your head may never find your feet. It may just float away on clouds of idiot ideas. Idiot ideas with ornate ornaments. Idiot ideas with silken garments. Between the two, between the flood of powerful, persuading passion and the cold, clinical scalpel of chopped logic, there is a third presence. Her name is Reason. Reason is kind and she has heart. She is subtle and gentle. She wanders the byways of your soul, whispering into your ear, saying, This way lies compromise. This way lies cool, calm judgment. This way lies justice and peace. This way lies the path of sweet, dynamic harmony. The way of sweet reason is not in general the way the world is but it is the way it could be. This one is called Body and Soul. Sometimes the tension between being alive and in the body, and the body being tired or pained or hungry or thirsty or energetic or breathless or sluggish or hyped up or constipated or full of life or slow or crippled and being a consciousness a mind, a spirit, a feeling organism with loves and fears and anxieties and longings and memories and thoughts and dreams and regrets and prayers. Sometimes that tension surfaces, emerges from the depths of half-awareness so that I realise that as a human being I exist at some sort of crossroads, some sort of intersection, some sort of point of transition between heaven and earth, between matter and spirit, between life and death, between now and eternity, between here and infinity, between the lover and the loved, between the seer and the seen, between the dancer and the dance. This one is called exhortation because that is what it is. We need to do all that we say we'll do. We need to practice truly what we preach. We need our actions and our voices to be true. 
and in fair harmony with everything we teach, we need to watch the colours of the sky and listen to the cadence of the breeze. We need to hear each laugh and feel each cry and think about what we can do to please he who made the holy fire from which our being flows and he who made the holy stream which nurtures all he knows. When the world seems to stop turning and all is still, when the mind seems to stop churning and the heart has drunk its fill, when the spirits seem to be moving swiftly like rabbits running fast downhill, when the bees seem to stop buzzing, though the springtime air still carries winter's chill, then we sense that great changes are afoot in realms invisible to us. This one is called allotment. I guess most people know what allotments are. Certainly in England, it's quite common to you rent a little bit of land and you and you grow vegetables on it and you you fancy yourself as a peasant farmer, keeping in in touch with the soil. I think in a lot of other countries too. Um, and and this one, so it talks about that, and it, it also is is a memory triggered of of my my grandfather, who was a seafarer, who was a, a fisherman, a trawlerman. And and the, the 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 feeling of the allotment and the memory of him sort of go together in the, in the poem. Allotment. The morning sunshine glistens on the long wet grass, and morning birds chatter and whoop. As I open the gate, a memory opens of sea docks, nineteen fifties, smell of salt, and deliciously bright chilled air, and men who went to sea in navy blue woolly jumpers and hats. As I turn over the soil, dig out weeds and plant new seeds, I feel my breathing steady and the oxygen connection to past, present, gift and future is as sure as birdsong. Breaking more soil, I pause, look up at the grey blue silent sky and almost hear the ripple as the prow heads out through the bay in search of fish, but then in search of mines. What do I search for? Clearer breath and clearer sight, and clearer thought. Asthmatic lungs curse as the war was cursed, but silver bright fish were sacrificed to feed the children. Are we still sacrificing children? On some Ethiopian plain the dryness is silent and the birds are gone. I have here now allotted space and time. I breathe and try to give thanks. But Manhattan depleted uranium dot com Daymares are like scattered, drifting, inverted GM poison dust clouds, storming heaven, draining last life from the fighting doomed. I turn another clod of earth and see a worm burrowing deep. Dig deep, breathe deep, children of the future. All will be well. I'm going to tell you some stories. They are stories of the Hoja Nasruddin. And for those who don't know, the Hoja Nasruddin is a character who appears in Middle Eastern and North African mythology. He is often described as a short character he has a great turban upon his head, and he has a long white beard and long white moustache, and rather a, a pot belly. And some say that he is a trickster, some say he's a fool, some say he's a wise man, and some say 
He is all three, and I believe he is that. So I will begin with a tale called The Shrine. The Hoja Nasruddin was raised by his father on the site of a shrine. His father was a renowned shrine keeper. It was said to be the site of a great teacher's burial. Pilgrims came from far and wide to visit this shrine, to worship, to pray, to find their truth. And as Hodger himself grew up into a young man, it was expected that he too would inherit that shrine and become a shrine keeper himself. But he said to his father, Father, I would like to seek my own truth and journey far. His father said, My son, I cannot stop you. And he gave his blessing. Hodja Nasruddin saddled his donkey and he set out. He travelled across deserts, dusty mountains, rocky pathways over hills and valleys. He journeyed through climates hot and dry and into climates cold and wet. He and his donkey journeyed for twelve long years and they learnt many things upon the way. But it was when Hodger was riding his donkey across a mountain path in Tibet, when his donkey began to flounder, his donkey began to struggle, the thin air and the journeying of 12 years had taken its toll on that poor donkey's legs and it collapsed on the spot. It gasped for breath, but it could not hold on to life. And there in that pathway, the Hodja Nasruddin's donkey died. Now Hodja was overcome with grief. He dug a hole, he buried the donkey, he, he formed a mound over it. And there he stayed, unable to move. He sat in meditation. So strong was his grief for his dear friend. The mountains above towered, and the torrents of water below were gushing, and still Hodger stayed in meditation. As people travelled along that mountain path, they came to know of the dervish who was sitting there, sitting on a grave, deep in meditation, and they whispered among themselves it must be the sight of a great holy man, a man of no mean accomplishments, for he sits there day in, day out, only pausing from his meditation to weep. Word spread of this holy sight, of the disciple who sat upon the grave. Soon a rich man heard the story and he journeyed himself to see the sight. And upon arrival, witnessing Hodger's meditation, he ordered his men to construct a domed shrine upon that site. Pilgrims came from far and wide they terraced the mountainside, they grew crops. They sold those crops to pay for the upkeep of the shrine and soon it became a great place of pilgrimage. Word spread far and wide, further and further and further until news of this famous shrine came to the ears of the Hoja Nasruddin's father himself. He immediately set out to visit this shrine and upon arrival, seeing his own son, he said, Hodja, tell me, tell me the story. And when Hodja did, his father smiled a big smile and said, my son, you have followed in my footsteps after all. For you are telling my story. Exactly the same thing happened to me when my donkey died 30 years ago. My next story is a tale called The Slap. One day, 
The Hodja Nasruddin was standing in the marketplace, minding his own business, when along came a complete stranger and slapped him in the face. Immediately, the stranger apologised and said, oh, sorry, I got the wrong man, but Hodja was having none of it. He grabbed the slapper and he dragged him to the magistrate. He told the magistrate exactly what had happened, hoping for some sympathy and compensation. But it became clear very quickly that the magistrate knew the criminal, the man who had slapped Hodja. And it became very clear that the two of them were making signals that they were making a deal. The magistrate said to the man, the punishment for your crime is three dirhams. Ah, well, I don't have three dirhams. Well, that, 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 that is fine, said the magistrate. You may go home and collect your three dirhams, and when you have collected them, you can bring them back. And Hodja Nasruddin, you may wait for him. And so the criminal was allowed to go home. And Hodja didn't like this. He waited and he waited and he waited. But of course, the man who slapped him never returned. He waited and waited until it was late in the afternoon and eventually he went up to the magistrate and he said, <clears throat> excuse me, so you are telling me that the price for a slap in the face is three dirhams? Well, yes, indeed it is. Upon hearing that, Hodja slapped the magistrate in the face and said, when your friend returns, you can keep the three dirhams. My next story is another tale of a donkey. A donkey and Hodja Nasruddin. Now there was a time in Hodja's life when he was spending quite a quite a great deal of time uh, crossing the border into the, into the next country, into the country beside his own. He would approach the border and the border guards noted that Hodja was always with a donkey with a great stack of hay on its back. He would cross the border and then a day later he would return upon foot looking rather more lavishly dressed. Now, the border guards became really suspicious of this behaviour. They believed that Hodja was smuggling something. So whenever he approached the border, they took to searching that great bale of straw upon the donkey's back. They searched, they rummaged, they looked through every straw, but they could see nothing that the Hodja Nasruddin was smuggling. Well, this went on for years, Hodja crossing the border and coming back, looking rather more wealthy than before. And the border guards were flummoxed. They had searched his body, they had searched the donkey, they had searched the haystack over and over again, and they never found a thing. Well, it was many years later when one of those border guards had retired and was sitting in a cafe when the Hodja Nasruddin came in. And the guard said, Hodja, how good it is to see you. Come sit, drink tea with me. And as the two men were drinking tea, the border guard said to him, Hodja, you can tell me now. Tell me. Now I'm retired after all these years. What on earth was it that you were smuggling? And Hodja leaned over and whispered in his ear, I was smuggling donkeys. Oh. <laughs> one more Hodja Nasruddin tale for you before I finish. And this is one of my favorites. Once upon a time, the Hodja Nasruddin needed to borrow a pot. He went to his neighbour's house. Hello, dear neighbour, could I borrow a pot from you? Now, his neighbour was a little reluctant, but he 
he gave Hodger a pot and said, be sure to bring it back to me within one week. Oh, of course, of course, of course. And Hodger went away with his pot. Now, one week later, his neighbour was waiting for him. But he didn't have to wait long because there was a knock upon the door. Much to his surprise, Hodger had returned the pot on time. Thank you, dear Hodger, thank you so much. And he took the pot from him and then he noticed, oh, my goodness me, what is this? Because inside the big pot, he could see a smaller pot. Before the neighbor could speak, Hodger was already telling the story. Yes, my neighbor, it's a wonderful thing. You see, while your pot was in my possession, the most marvelous thing occurred. Your pot gave birth to a smaller pot. Well, the neighbour agreed it was a wonderful occurrence and quickly closed the door. A few weeks later, Hodger came and knocked on his neighbour's door again. Could I borrow your pot again, please? Now this time, his neighbour was not reluctant at all. He handed over the pot and he said, thank you very much, be sure to bring it back in a week. Off went Hodger, and one week passed. But Hodger did not return, and neither did the pot. And the neighbour grew more and more concerned, until eventually the neighbour decided himself to go around to Hodger's house and find out what had happened. Hodger answered the door. Oh, dear neighbour. Oh, dear neighbour, it is terrible. Hodger Nasruddin, where is my pot? Oh, dear neighbour, it is terrible, it is terrible, it is terrible. What on earth are you talking about, man? Give me my pot. It's a week has gone. Oh, my neighbour, it is terrible. You see, while your pot was in my possession, it sadly died. But that is nonsense. How on earth can a pot die? But my neighbour... If a pot can give birth to a smaller pot, surely a pot can die. Thank you very much.
There is a place that I go to within myself. Climb into the hidden nook behind the curtain, behind the stage in the main hall of the primary school. We munch rice crispy marshmallow squares and giggle one to another. Shh, we can't make too much noise lest someone uncover our secret den. We play games and share stories. Climb the ancient, moss-worn staircase of solid stone. Ascending, look out over nature's patchwork carpet of olive, beige and intense green. It is quiet now. I am alone. So much space. Peer through the sprawl of reaching trees dotting the weaving path through the timeless garden. Up to the bird's bath and the glistening, silent stream. There is a place that I go to within myself. Lavender, jasmine, rosemary and bergamot. Cascades of bubbles and hovering streams of wispy steam. Subtle flickering half-light glowing. My head under the water for a split second and I am in the womb once more. Held. Alone. I pace the streets, sketchy, searching, jittery, always in a rush, preoccupied, distracted, never quite where I want to be. Desperation, anticipation, craving, animated, jagged, dash the dirty winding streets, here, there, I see not much which catches my eye, all elusive to the absent, floating, seeker, possessed. Soul holding on to the body, by a mere shimmering cobweb, thin strand, legs and arms moved by a puppet master's reins, up, down, mine eyes doth miss the meandering reflections of traffic-like colours streaming in lay-by puddles. The shrugging lamp posts, the heavy curve of the proud, moody bridge, and the cooing birds singing lullabies to this mad town. Now back to my room, door clicks, I close it behind, my mind is singular, focused, nothing else exists. I perform what is my ritualistic routine, my means of coming home, of returning. Hectic traffic and the pain of never having been held. Loneliness and the overwhelming anxiety of being in the world with its demands, its pressures, its dream-shattering, gum-producing, life-taking, bomb-dropping, money-grabbing, life-sucking, heart-numbing, position-seeking, rejection, issuing aches, all dissolve away, one heartbeat at a time. Then dancing clouds and laughter, union with the life-giving ether, encasing all trials in her welcoming breast and... Nothing else matters, laying there on the bedroom floor rug, looking up at the ceiling. There is a place that I go to within myself, but even there it is not safe. Not safe for a heart consumed by loathing, eaten up by the fear of evil and a loss of meaning. And what would make you understand? Quote Milton of Satan's lonesome and heart-wrenching dismality. Horror and doubt distract his troubled thoughts, and from the bottom stir the hell within him, for within him hell, he brings and round about him, nor from hell one step no more than from himself can fly by change of place. The fallen one could not escape, by virtue of his inner state, polluted and calamitous. One wonders if he felt at loss and driven from pain to hate, as is so often the case, aspired to wreck the ships of those deemed the worthy of love and praise on the rocks of debauchery and disgrace, a debasement of the human race. So, venturing out from home and bed, onto the bus with heart of lead, a thousand eyes peering into your soul, your thoughts heard by all, and no escape from the intrusions of the external, piercing your internal, it is not safe here. I do not feel safe. And what would reach the sunken ship submerged by thoughts of wickedness and a thousand foot deep? There is a place that I go to within myself. I take in the contents of my heart and lift them up, surrender them and with humility state, nay can I do it alone. Redemption by thine mighty grace, thine be my shelter and my sanctuary space. There is a place that I go to within myself. It is mine, but it does not belong to me, like a room shared with a sibling or a roommate at university. So too is this meadow a grazing plain for both myself and my Lord. In this sacred inner garden, I must with pure actions behave so as not to plant black weeds inducing the joy of the serpent and the disheartedness of the one in whose garden I play and find rest, sustenance, joy the place where my small spark connects to the light that transcends all materiality. 
There is a place that I go to within myself. An introvert am I. I relish the smell of books. A fireplace crackling, carpets of deep burgundy embellished with brown, soft underfoot. Time aplenty and a deluge of rain descending outside with the beautiful sound which it brings. The mercy of water. How it draws from out of the depths of the earth luscious crops, fruits and flowers. I shall sit here a while. The cat curled in restful sleep at peace on the corner of the sofa. I shall read about painting and fairy tales, woodlands and poetry. There is a place that I go to within myself, grind the wheat into powdery flour, splash with fresh water and knead on the wooden bench, doughy and stone-coloured bread balls lined up on the baking slabs prepared for the fiery kiln, soft and steaming, squishy and elemental, cut perfect discs from the orange carrot stems, precise and with equal thickness, Toss into the misty pot to merge with sweet bell pepper. Into the bowl scrape cool cucumber and zesty lime with curly purple lettuce bunched. Now mash the pillowy potato to a milky smush and sprinkle with tiny parsley ribbons. Miso, harissa and fresh pesto, pots and pans, a wooden spoon to stir vegetables in their rich juices. Orderly rows of cocoa squares with warming cinnamon, all dusted with sieved snowy icing sugar. Wash aubergine till slick like seals glistening back and bake till tender. Then thick, bulging tomato and soft, fleshy cheese. There is a place that I go to within myself. I close the door and erect the canvas. Mix the hues of cobalt and mustard. See the different shades swim on the palette. Smudge them, green and ultramarine. Lapisuli, claret and cherry. Golden lemon, deep purple, sap green and blushing rose. Spread watery wash across the white till coloured arc sweeps the horizon and sparks appear to join and repel, till shapes jut out to softly tell and relate perennial myths and recurrent truths, subconscious secrets striving upwards to catch breath from neath the surface of the abyss. There is a place that I go to within myself. I find myself right back there sometimes, just after I open my eyes from sleep. The salty, liberated sea crashing and ebbing at the shore. The odd, brave swimmer and a family of sailing boats bobbing on the surface, probably off to procure the daily catch. I am reminded of home, and I sense the palpable joy of connection and peace. Some call it sea fever. Yes, the longing to be united and close to one's friend, the sea. Hair billowing, tangled and wispy, sun beaming and crystal bright. There is a place that I go to within myself. I find it there in the embrace of the tickly grass. Lift the tools from the dry, smoky smelling shed. Prepare and part the yielding earth, inhale the woody pine. Plant seeds and tend to the bursting bushes, shrubs and blossoms. Heady scent and heaven scent, growth to be pruned and picked, cut and woven, trellises of climbers that interlace the lattice work and rain down overhead, pregnant with flowers and medicinal plants, miles of marigolds and sprinklings of powder blue forget me nots, rich red roses and rippling wheat fields of neutral shade with stems submitting in the serene, the easy fields, dreamy. There is a place that I go to within myself, lost amidst the torrents of material and garment, coloured thread collections, a haven of texture, silky sheets that slip off of the fingers and stiff sun-stained denim bleached by strong rays from blue summer's days. White blouses and crisp steam-pressed shirts hanging, heavy feathery duvets and jumpers that feel like hugs when you put them on. Sumptuous velvet, measuring tapes, buttons, dyes, bobby pins. Swimming through this fabric maze, a seamstress, Dagar's washerwoman, sewing deep into the evening, the loom weaving, radio wafting. There is a place that I go to within myself, where the work of my hands and the feeling in my heart are one, where all that I am and all that exists are connected, together where the overflowing love and object of my love have no space in between, where duality meets in a loving embrace and no questions asked of what to do or where to go or how to be.
There is a place that I go to within myself. Is there a place as such for you? The Wanderer Always, the one alone longs for mercy, the maker's mildness. Though troubled in mind, across the ocean ways he has long been forced to stir with his hands the frost-cold sea and walk in exile's paths. Fate is fully fixed, Thus spoke the wanderer, mindful of troubles, of cruel slaughters, and the fall of dear kinsmen. Often alone, every first light of dawn, I have had to speak my sorrows. There is no one living to whom I would dare to reveal clearly my deepest thoughts. I know it is true that it is in the lordly nature of a nobleman to closely bind his spirit's coffer, hold his treasure hoard, whatever he may think. The weary mind cannot withstand fate. The troubled heart can offer no help. And so those eager for fame often bind fast in their breast coffers a sorrowing soul. Just as I have had to take my own heart, often wretched, cut off from my homeland, far from dear kinsmen, and bind it in fetters. Ever since long ago, I hid my gold-giving friend in the darkness of earth and went wretched. Winter sad, over the binding wave, sought, hall-sick, a treasure giver. Wherever I might find, far or near, someone in a mead hall who knew of my people, or who wanted to comfort me, friendless, accustomed me to joy. He who has come to know how cruel a companion is sorrow, to one who has few dear protectors, will understand this. The path of exile claims him, not pattern gold, a frost-bound spirit, not the solace of earth. He remembers hall holders and treasure-taking, 
how in his youth his gold-giving lord accosted him to the feast. That joy all fades. And so, he who has long been forced to forgo his dear lord's beloved words of counsel will understand. When sorrow and sleep, both together, often bind up the wretched exile, it seems in his mind that he clasps and kisses his lord of men, and on his knee lays hands and head, as he sometimes long ago, in earlier days, enjoyed the gift throne. But when the friendless man awakens again, and sees before him the fallow waves, seabirds bathing, spreading their feathers, frost falling and snow mingled with hail, then the heart's wounds are much heavier. Pain after pleasure. Sorrow is renewed when the mind flies out to the memory of kinsmen. He greets them with joy, greedily surveys hall companions. They all swim away. The floating spirits bring too few well-known voices. Cares are renewed for one who must send over and over a weary heart across the binding of the waves. And so I cannot imagine for all this world why my spirit should not grow dark when I think through all of this life of men. How they suddenly gave up the hall floor, mighty warrior tribes. Thus this middle earth droops and decays one day at a time. And so a man cannot become wise before he has weathered his share of winters in this world. A wise man must be patient, neither too hot-hearted, nor too hasty with words, nor too weak in war, nor too unwise in thoughts, neither fearful, nor fawning, nor too greedy for wealth, never eager for boasting before he truly understands a man must wait when he makes a boast until the brave spirit understands truly whither the thoughts of his heart will turn. The wise man must realize how ghostly it will be when all the wealth of this world stands waste. And now here and there throughout this middle earth, wall stands blasted by wind, beaten by frost, the buildings crumbling. The wine halls topple, their rulers lie deprived of all joys. The proud old troops all fell by the wall. War carried off some, sent them on their way. One a bird carried off over the high seas. One the grey wolf shared with death. And one a sad-faced man hid in an earthen grave. The ancient ruler of men thus wrecked this enclosure until the old works of giants stood empty without the sounds of their former citizens. He who deeply considers, with wise thoughts, this foundation and this dark life, old in spirit, often remembers so many ancient slaughters and says these words. Where have the horses gone? Where are the riders? Where is the giver of gold? Where are the seats of the feast? Where are the joys of the hall? Oh, the bright cup. Oh, brave warrior. Oh, the glory of princes. How the time passed away, slipped into nightfall as if it had never been. There still stands in the path of this dear warrior's a wall wondrously high with serpentine stains. A torrent of spears took away the warriors, bloodthirsty weapons, Fate the mighty, 
and the storms batter the stone walls. Frost falling binds up the earth, the chaos of winter. When blackness comes, night shadows looms, sends down from the north harsh hailstones in hatred of men. All is toilsome in the earthly kingdom. The work of fate changes the world under heaven. Here wealth is fleeting. Here friends are fleeting. Here man is fleeting. Here woman is fleeting. All the security of the earth will stand empty. So said the wise one in his mind, sitting apart in meditation. He is good who keeps his word, and the man who never too quickly shows the anger in his breast, unless he already knows the remedy, how a nobleman can bravely bring it about. It will be well for one who seeks mercy, consolation from the Father in heaven, where for us all stability stands. Good evening, Salaam Alaikum, and thank you for inviting me. I'd like to start with a Kurdish folk song, Malam Barkir. It's about being on the move and fleeing persecution. And I'd like to sing it remembering refugees all over the world, forced to leave their homes in search of a safe place and sanctuary. Oh 
This next song is also Kurdish, this time a lullaby. And I thought I would sing it this evening because I was thinking that across cultures and throughout time, a mother's love and a mother's arms are one of the first places we look for that feeling of peace and safety. And this mother says, sleep sweetly, my dear. O oh, sapling of my life, I am like a gardener, taking care of you with my heart. Sleep sweetly, and I will take away your pain. I'd like to end with the words of Mulana Jalaluddin Rumi, known for his poetry of love. He says, My heart is like a lute, each chord crying with longing and pain. My beloved is watching me, 
wrapped in silence. And Rumi emphasizes the sanctuary we find within ourselves, through the heart. I will never leave this house of light. I will never leave this blessed town, for here I have found my love. And here I will stay for the rest of my life. If this world turns into a sea of trouble, I will brave the waves and steer my mind ship to the safe shore of love. If you are a seeker of profit, go on and may God be with you. But I am not willing to exchange my truth. I have found the heart and will never leave this house of light. O oh friend, you made me lovingly. You clothed me in a robe of skin and blood, then planted deep inside me a seed from your heart. You turned the whole world into a sanctuary where you are the only one. Do not worry if all our hearts break. Thousands more will appear. We have fallen in the arms of love where all is music. We have fallen in the arms of love. If all the harps in the world were burned down, still inside our The hidden music playing in our hearts. Do not worry if all the candles flicker and die. We the spark that lights the We sing like the foam upon the sea, precious gems lie deep beneath. Precious gems lie deep beneath. The tenderness in our soul reflects what is hidden in the depths. Stop the flow of Open your heart and let the Spirit speak. Open your heart and let the Spirit speak.
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to play music for this wonderful opening of a beautiful space, inshallah. Um, I'm very happy to be able to play, uh, inshallah, a piece on the Sarod uh, and also a piece on the Oud. And the themes of multiplicity, uh, finding unity, and the theme of sanctuary are both very close to my heart as being a jack of all trades, master of absolutely none. Um, I do play a variety of instruments, but still through those different styles of music and different instruments, there's certainly a unifying theme for me anyway. And uh, by the virtue of unity in multiplicity, I'm able to, alhamdulillah, have the gift of playing music and the gift of being able to inshallah share it with you and sanctuary uh, as soon as inshallah one is in the presence of Allah Almighty uh, there is no greater sanctuary verily it is the only sanctuary um, so in light of that uh, thank you for listening to this music assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Thank you. 